Well, it's, listen, Walton, we are so happy to have you with us tonight. We're just thrilled. I have to say, um, he's really, I don't want to gush or be a fanboy, but he's really one of my favorite artists ever. And when I first, when I was in my first year at this school, it was the year that you had the um, show at the Brooklyn Museum. Oh my God. And I walked in, there was like a kind of organized thing from the school to go see it. And I walked in and there was that huge room, that huge uh, elephant piece uh, like on the wall of that room when you walked in. And I just had never seen anything like that before. And I was like, oh my God, it, this is possible. You know, like this is, we can learn to do stuff like this. And I was so just wildly impressed. And I feel like I've seen pretty much every show you've done in New York, but I also happen to be some, several years later in Paris. And I, I don't even know how I found out about it, but all of a sudden I heard about this museum called the Musée de la Chasse, which is like a hunting museum. And they were doing a show of Walton's work. And it was, again, so I, I you know, we, we beeline straight over to it, and it is such a weird place. Beautiful, <laughs> old building, filled with just like incredible artifacts and old hunting paintings and stuff. But they had done something that was so spectacular because there were some places where your like monumentally sized paintings were just there, but in other places they were just interjected into, into um, sort of salon style settings that were already happening in the museum. And then you went into other parts of the museum and there would be like a million deer heads or dog heads or something, and as you looked at them, one of them would start moving and snap. <laughs> you know, which would be like, what? Have I been in here too long? But um, anyway, He's also been a great friend to the school. We honored him at Take Home a Nude one year and he helped us raise a ton of money. And that was really a high point again for me. So um, normally in these kind of things, we like, you know, tell you, tell the audience every, every museum and collection and everything you've been, but we just suffice to say that, you know, he's a big deal. He's in the Smithsonian and the Whitney and a lot of other things and had a major European retrospective tour and all that kind of stuff. And the Toshin book, is that the, um, the new edition that we were just signing? If it had the line on the cover, that's the that's latest That's the line, one. yeah. yeah that's the that latest one. edition. It only came out maybe like last year. Or oh, for, I, I think I mentioned this to you, but for many, for a long time, your book was my favorite gift to give to people. So like all of my family members have this <laughs> book and most of my best friends for like any birthday, Christmas, anything. Hey, you haven't given me one. Now, there you go. Yeah. I'm <laughs> now, waiting now, you, know what's, you know what's coming then. Yeah. Next my book. Um, so I guess, you know, there's so many things I want to ask you about today, Walton, but why don't we, I mean, we were talking about this. I want to get to what you're doing currently, but first I want to hear a little bit about when you started doing this kind of work. Like, this was not popular. This was not uh, yeah. the moment. This was like... Definitely not. Yeah, and nobody was doing this kind of thing. You know? I mean, in when I, I got to New York in 1982, and I hadn't quite embarked on the work that I'm doing now at that point. Um, but, it, but I was making figurative work, and I was making relatively realistic figurative work compared to the rest of the art world. So <clears throat> there was figurative work, but it was like Basquiat and Keith Haring and stuff that was going on in the 80s. Yeah. And art, art professionals would come over to my studio because in New York, in those days, it was a smaller art world, I would probably say. Um, and it was geographic, like below 14th Street and in parts of Brooklyn. I was, I moved to Williamsburg and Greenpoint area in 1982, and there was no artistic scene there, and there was no gentrification. There, it was absolutely whatever was there. The south side was, you know, there were those spray painted wall murals right. about the person who got shot the day before, and Greenpoint itself was Polish, and there was almost no English language signs. And that part of Frost Street where I lived for a while was very Italian. So it wasn't like it is now. Um, I, hope, I hope you bought real estate at the time. 
I didn't. I couldn't afford anything. I was uh, working as a wood refinisher and a carpenter and a welder and a, I, they forgot my trust fund part, my parents. <laughs> they forgot that part. So oh. I didn't have any dough and I was trying to pay off my risky education. And uh, did, did RISD influence what you were doing now? What it was... influenced my, my work ethic mm -hmm. because uh, then when I was there, it was uh, definitely grittier, uh, more bohemian school than it is now. Mm -hmm. All schools were, I think, in mm -hmm. a way. But generally, I think it's true here probably too. Art, for some reason, art schools, being a sort of workaholic is valued. And, and working late in the studio is value. You know, people rise in those environments when they work harder than everybody else. And that was really inspiring. And then Brown University was right up the hill and I made friends with uh, writers, Jeff Eugenides. Uh, I went and took class, you were allowed to take classes. This is funny. I was like a fucking juvenile delinquent high school dropout type of person and my my dad left when I was 11 and my brother and I took over the house and started dealing weed and you know it was just this shit show and this is suburban Westchester so it's not like it's not like you know some sort of rough right. mean does, streets that's a Larchmont no yeah exactly it starts in Larchmont ends in Croton it was all like a kind of sweet environment yeah nevertheless the police were like cruising the house because they knew what was going on in there and um uh, what was I going to say? Oh, when I got to RISD, um, I, I, my mom actually saved money and sent me to the summer session program. And, um, you know, she was suddenly a single mom my, and, and she had four kids. And so it was hard for me to get there. But when I got there, I felt at home. It was completely legit. And I started to draw like crazy and paint and do all this stuff. And I became this paint splattered kind of fucking little Ramones like character. Um, and at that point were you already fascinated with animals? Yeah, I had been fascinated with animals my whole life. So the first drawings I did were of animals. Mm -hmm. And my, I was obsessed with the Museum of Natural History. My dad worked in the city. And so I would, you know, we would go meet in the city and then go to that museum. And I was just fucking blown away. And I wanted to make art like that. And then when I got to RISD, it, it wasn't that cool to think like, oh, I want to draw animals. So I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, I jumped around from department to department. And I, I was in the, I got a degree in film animation, but it was a BFA. Mm -hmm. And I found out while I was there, I was a kind of a shitty film animator, but I painted every day. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm a painter. I got to just put all my chips on this, mm -hmm. this square, go to New York. I had friends who helped. RISD was great because there was a network of craftspeople. Mm -hmm. So like some industrial design majors and stuff had these like uh, restoration companies and we did like restored apartments in the Dakota. So, you know, I was going in the Dakota with knee pads on and a respirator and like on my knees restoring baseboard or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, so you could make a living. Yeah, the cool thing is, later somebody in the Dakota bought one of my paintings. I'm like 35, at 40 years old, something like this. They bought one of my paintings and invited me to dinner to show me. And I walked in the fucking front door instead of the service freight elevator thing and riding up with the garbage in the freight elevator without knee pads on, you know, walking in and like sitting at the table and looking at my painting above and it was like this amazing moment for me and I conveyed the moment to the people and they were really uncomfortable because <laughs> they're like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear that you were the, the worker that I just that mistreated today. Yeah. Oh God. So, um, so at what point did, um, what, what was the turning point where you started to feel like your work was getting attention? Uh, pretty much when Paul Kassman took me on. I mean, but he's a big deal. How did you get him interested? I, I was def I definitely had about a decade of being an artist artist. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about some of the artists that would have known about my work. Right. So like uh, Alexis Rockman was making work that was um, a similar subject matter. Sure. And he and I met and he was like, you're fucking awesome, et cetera, et cetera. And John Curran and... The, the people that were figurative painters at that time, mm -hmm. 
were aware that I was doing something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was what, jumping. Was that, Alexis, like I only do beneath sea level, and you only do above <laughs> sea level. Is that how you guys partitioned it? He, yeah, he does insects. I'm not going <laughs> to touch insects. Yeah, a little bit. I, I definitely don't want to go near some of his stuff. <laughs> Obviously, I don't want to do a fly's eye view of something. Uh, but anyhow, I, I um, Marsha Tucker, who ran the new museum. She put me in a group show. Uh, she was one of those people that called everybody she knew and said, you gotta go to the studio and check it out. Oh, that's great. Marsha was a well, guardian angel. I babysat Ruby, her kid, who would never remember me, but because she was like four and five. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bill Arning at, at, was at White Columns. He was, he was a big fan. He had, he, I gave him one of my pieces because he put me, he put me in touch with people. Irving Blum came over to my studio and I was still starving. Wow. He was getting ready to leave Blum Hellman and he, him and Hellman were, had become mortal enemies. Mm -hmm. And he was going to split off on his own and not really just do private work. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to hand me over to the Hellman. I was like, can you give me a show at Blum Hellman? Because it still existed. He was like, I don't want you to end up with Hellman because he's Joseph Bastard. So it was all this stuff holding me back a tiny bit, but yeah. I definitely had uh, momentum. Mm -hmm. It was like you can't hide it under a rock. Yeah. If people like it, they came and saw what I could do, what I was capable of. And did it look like the work now? Starting in about 1992, it did. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I decided to channel Audubon's uh, so my approach to Audubon in those days was to literally take an Audubon plate mm -hmm. and then make a kind of psychological deep dive into all the stuff I didn't like about Audubon mm -hmm. and all the stuff that he left out and imagine Audubon in a sort of malarial fever. What kind of a nightmare would he have? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to think about it that way. Um, so because I kind of disliked him from reading all this stuff. I don't, I don't like Audubon. I like the work. Yeah, I, I'm, I of course it's so fun to look yeah. at the work, yeah. and I I used it as. So my first thing is I wanted to own one, but of course you can't have one yeah. if you're a carpenter or whatever I was at that time. So I was like, I'll I'll make my own, and then they're going to have like Tourette syndrome. They're going to have this weird wrongness to them. So one of the very first I did that actually Bill Arning owns was a Sparrowhawk, which is now called a Kestrel, but mm -hmm. he called it a Sparrowhawk. And it, he's, and I revisited this image many times since, but anyway, the, I did this in 1992. A Sparrowhawk, and he's on top of a pile of sparrows. He's killed 500 sparrows. And there's one flying by that seems like it might get away from him, and he's like, ah! You know, fuck, I need to get that one too. Like he doesn't know he has enough already. Yeah. And so it's an image of greed and it's an image of just insatiable ego. It's an image that I revisited in a print recently um, because it felt like the right time. It was another one of those moments. Yeah. But it made sense in the 90s too. Yeah. You had Wall Street movie and all that kind of shit happened. Right. And when you walked around New York, there was this cultural war in my head. Because the weird thing about the geographic art world, which doesn't exist anymore, that we had the East Village that had starving artists in it. Mm -hmm. You had priests, even more starving artists like me out in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Then you had like Soho with the fucking Eric Fischel type guys that you a great friend of the, this place but he was you know he was like a decade ahead of me and those guys snapped up all the lofts and everything so there was no hope of that yeah by the time i got there in 1982 it's over yeah you know it's over and uh so but but i i got my foot in in williamsburg where nobody wanted to be so there was always this real estate right. race right they always get this wrong in the movies, unless it's Julian Schnabel making the movie. But when they try to make movies about artists, they always have them talking about art as if they 
They talk about fucking real estate. Artists don't talk about art. They talk about like, where am I gonna live? You know, we can usually get a job. It's easy. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I can sheetrock. Jesus fuck, Christ, are you kidding? Like, yes, I can do this. I can put the finish on the fucking wood. I can frame your stupid ass picture. I can carry it up the steps. I know what it's worth. Yeah. So I, you know, I did all of those kinds of jobs. Um, that's the stuff that artists, so artists aren't worried about getting work. They're worried about getting a place to work, right. a place they can work. So then you ended up hooking up with Kasman. And then in about 1990 something, like around in there, mm -hmm. like 95 or four, or mm -hmm. somewhere in there, I, I, I threw the towel in him. Well, I was talking to one of my friends who lived in the Berkshires. And he lived in a rental house. And he went and bought a house. He, he has, you know, whatever. Anyway, he, he said, um, oh, the house I used to rent is, is available now. And I said, how much is the rent? He said, $750 a month. And I was like, it's a house with a fireplace on like acres of land. And I'm like, we're moving. We had a child already. My, my first wife and I, mm -hmm. long life, um, moved, moved, moved up to the Berkshires and um, um, Kasman called me like a month later. Weirdly, I leave the city saying I've thrown in the towel, nothing's working out for me. I'll move to the Berkshires and teach. You know, I sort of said, whatever, yeah. fuck it. You know, you just do it. Yeah. I, ha I don't have a plan B. But I was thinking, like, I, I got to come up with one. Yeah. Um, and he, he called up and came up, looked around, said, oh, my God, I like everything I've seen. He's like, he right away bought a couple of pictures so that my rent was paid. And he said, just get to work. We'll have a show. Awesome. And then he sold some right away. And then it off and running. So the first show was in on... Grand Street across from what used to be Lucky Strike and that little gallery he had down here-ish. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter Sheldahl reviewed it and called me an art star. Oh, wow. Um, he didn't really like the show, but he just said art stars like... Yeah. Art, he said the art star now is like the stars in the heavens. Like, there's so many. You'll never fucking keep track of them all, you know, unless you or an astrologist or a star. You know, he made a sort of backhanded compliment. Yeah. Like, he's an art star, but like, he's just one in the firmament. Yeah, well, just to get his attention is already in He wrote a really good constructive crit. And I actually told him that years later. I said, it really helped me. Because he said, heavy-handed political messages? No. Is but that, and that's what you were doing at that point, or? He thought. Uh -huh. Uh, a little of that, but he said when they're funny uh -huh. and they have a heavy-handed political message that's hidden, yes, please. Right. And he was absolutely right. The, the more gr gruesome ones were less successful than the ones that were sort of amusing. Well, I just had a slight little aside about Paul Kasman. When we were doing a show of Warhol drawings here, I went up to see Paul Kasman to ask him if we could borrow a bunch of his because he had a trove of them and I walked into his office and we were sitting there talking and there was a huge Walton Ford tiger that was I think it was a tiger if I'm remembering correctly that was like taking up one wall of his office in preparation for a, an upcoming show and I thought okay this is a good omen I think this is gonna work out and it did and it did it he's did. perfectly happy to do this yeah he was great he was in it for the right reasons he was one of the last of the great kind of gentleman art dealers like yeah like Castelli type people. Yeah. Um, he didn't give a shit if your work was selling or it was popular or hip. Yeah. He just was, he would fall in love with the artist, him, the actual person or, or she or he or, yeah. you know. And then it, he was in. And when he was in, he was loyal and he was in love with the work and he did everything he could to make it happen. Um, I wanna, you, you were talking about, uh, you know, the, the riffing on the nightmarish Audubon. But I, I feel like in some of the reading I, I have done about you, you talk about, I get all my ideas by reading and finding these stories that are actually like better than what you could make up. Yes, yes. So, yes. Talk, so talk to me about that a little bit. Well, it just, it just works that way. Um, well, we could yeah, do a okay, slide. Okay. Let's start with the first slide, because I could talk about that. 
is a painting called La Madre. It's, what you don't know about this picture is it's nine feet high by 12 feet wide, and it's a watercolor on paper with gouache and ink. But it's bigger than anything in this room. Um, so the, the grizzly bear is ridiculously oversized. It's like a King Kong sized grizzly bear. It doesn't make any sense. The head is, is this wide around. You know? um, and so the reading is, I read, uh, I found a book called The California Grizzly, and I read it, and it's about the California grizzly bear was a subspecies of grizzly bear that lived in California. And when the Spanish got there, it actually had a population explosion because the Spaniards, the early Spanish colonial people, the missions that you go to California to visit, the economic engine of that expansion was the hide trade. It was leather. That's how they made their money. So this longhorn weird cattle that they have out west, that cattle is not a beef cattle. That's a leather cattle. It doesn't matter whether it has any fat on its bones, right? You just raise it, you kill it, you skin it, and you just throw the carcass into a fucking ravine. Nobody gives a shit about the meat. And so the Spanish introduced this as an industry to California. Because if, if you've been to California, it's not a lot to eat for the animals. And it's dry parts of the year and, you know, whatever. It's not that hospitable, let's just be frank. And so the, they needed this as a sort of hardy animal that they're not... So, okay. And there's always going to be enough meat to eat if this is your business. So, so the missions functioned this way. When I read that, and then they said because they were throwing beef carcasses into the ravines, the grizzly bear population actually exploded. And, and as a result, the Spanish, being Spanish, decided they would come up with a blood sport. So they would go out like caballeros and rope them with, and, and like rope grizzly bears. It was like three or four cow, cowboys at a time, caballeros at a time, and then they have rawhide, you know, a, 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 a lariat, well actually we know from Power of the Dog. The lariat thing, they, they don't make that out of hemp, they make that out of leather. It's rawhide like your dog chew. So that's a, that's a bitch of a rope. So they would rope them with that and just pull them apart. Have the horses all back up in different directions and yank, oh yank the grizzly bear apart. Oh. And they, this was fun. You know, it's like bullfighting. Yeah. Let's do something that we could get killed yeah. doing. That's, you know, this is a very, very Iberian Peninsula kind of way of going about things. So this went on and on and on and on. And then that whole attitude towards the grizzly bear was sort of ingrained. And by 1930, of course, they weren't roping them anymore. They were just shooting them or poisoning them, but they were gone. And they're the state flag emblem, so that's like the cool thing. Like, there's a California grizzly on the flag. That's right, yeah. So I read this book, and I'm like, I got to come up with something. But the way that I'm going to do it is I'm not going to make a, a fucking illustration of that. Like, I'm going to make something that is like hypnagogic is what I like to use that word. It's the it's state between awake and asleep. Yeah. So you're like dreaming it. So what, what does that look like? I, I, I sat around doing, I did a couple of straight, kind of like documentary images of California grizzlies being roped. But it wasn't good, it wasn't good enough. So this, I decided La Madre is the spirit of all of the grizzly bears that have been roped. And she's like, she's like Moby Dick. You'll see ropes are hanging off of her neck. She's been roped. They're dragging into the cave. There's one on her toe in the front, but you can't get her. She's too huge. She's coming out of her cave. In the background are some caballeros roping a young grizzly. And there's the mission in the back with like the fires and for all the kind of nasty boiling of hides and stuff that they're doing. It's a factory. Yeah. So I'm, I'm giving you this little capsule history of colonial California with this sort of dream image of a giant grizzly that also is informed by Hollywood movies like King Kong or Mighty Joe Young. So that fits in with California. So you gotta, I, I, when it clicks, it clicks. And when it clicks for me, I don't really care what anyone else thinks. Right. At this point, I'm making something that I think personally, 
is so rich with history, with invested, with the sense of place, everything from missions all the way up to Hollywood is in this picture, and it's honoring an extinct animal that I'm super interested in, that I'm actually sort of glad when I'm walking around in Big Sur, which I like to do sometimes, isn't around anymore. I don't, I don't necessarily want to stumble on a California grizzly in a slot canyon in, in Big Sur. So I get it. I get why there aren't any more. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, already, they still have great whites in the ocean when they surf. You would have basically great whites on the land as well. Yeah. I, it's funny, I was reading, I was surfing around reading the Times like a couple weeks ago, and this thing popped up that said, um, do you know what to do if you're attacked by a bear? Or if, you, if you're walking in the Yeah, yeah, I love when the New York Times, and somebody named Mindy on the Upper West Side is writing this. I, <laughs> yeah, right? But I sat there and read it, I was like, no, but I need to. Yeah, but, you know, and I'm not 100% sure the New York Times is where I'm going for that information. <laughs> But whatever, yeah, I know. But talk about a slow reveal then. I love the way these images are so, you know, kind of breathtaking just on instant, you know, on, on This is pressure. pretty good in person because it's so huge. Yeah, but then that there's so much behind it. Let's keep going. Let's keep yeah, going. yeah. Oh yeah, one more. So when, so there's another one where it's like, so Audubon, this is an Audubon painting. Again, this is 10 feet by 5 feet. This is a huge watercolor. So all the animals are life size when they're not, when they're not uh, fantasy animals like the grizzly was. So these are golden eagles. The golden eagle plate in the birds of, of his, his elephant folio in Audubon's work shows a, a, a golden eagle that was captured in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And it was captured by a farmer in a fox trap. He had set a trap for a fox, and the, it had caught the eagle by one, he put a dead rabbit in it. So the yeah. eagle came down to eat the dead rabbit. Boom, the, the trap got him just by one toe. And the eagle is a huge, powerful animal, so it dragged the trap along. With, you, one of the things, if you're trapping animals, you attach uh, the trap to a branch or a log you don't want the animal to tear its leg off, yeah, so but it you don't, it, but yeah, off. so you, dr it has to drag something a little bit heavier than itself, or, or a little, maybe a little bit lighter than itself, actually, so that it, it just wears itself out, and you can find a trail in the snow, or, or oh. through the leaves, and find your animal. So, um, this is, again, I do all this research, though I know, this stuff, I have a book called Camp Life and the Tricks of Trapping that was published in like 1860 and it gives me tons of information that I need. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, so this, this eagle dragged the trap for a mile and then Audubon took the eagle and bought it from the farmer who had captured it, it was alive still. And then Audubon decided he wanted to, he needed to kill it to do his work because the way he used to do the work was to lay the animal down on a gridded sheet, on a gridded piece of board, actually, in the position that he wanted. He could pin it down, and then he would grid off his paper and then draw, draw an outline to get it perfectly, well, you know, and then, um, and then just spend hours and hours. So it was the middle of the winter, so that it took him forever to kill this eagle. The eagle was so tenacious. He tried to smoke it to death, and it wouldn't die. Then he put sulfur on the flames and it wouldn't die. And so it just went on for days until he finally pierced it with a steel, sharpened steel instrument and, it, and killed it. And then painted it for 14 days and then Audubon got sick. He got a fever after like 14 days of staying up all night. You know, he martyred himself and said, oh, I had this delirium and I was in a delirium and I almost died from painting this. You know, I take great pains to bring you the greatest art that I can. This is the yeah. way he used to talk. He's yeah. like kind of ridiculous. And so this is how the painting was done. So my idea, again, my idea is when Audubon had fallen sick, he could have these nightmares tumbling in his head. And this was the one I came up with. It's like three of these eagles, they all have traps on their claws. They're all... They're not just dragging the trap, but they've risen up like a big meteor. Maybe they're, and he actually is over here. 
with his fever like he's hanging on a branch, he's about to fall into the chasm with the eagle. <laughs> so it doesn't, it's, you know, it's the way we dream. It's yeah. not the way we, so, and, and, and you know how 19th century medical stuff is so fucking strange. So he said, I, when I got sick, I had a spasmodic affection. That was his, his diagnosis. And so that's the name of this painting, the spasmodic affection. Okay. Just because, what? What's a spasmodic affection? I, I need to work that into, uh, Peter, I can't come to work today. I've got a spasmodic, <laughs> I've got a spasmodic affection. affection, exactly. <laughs> All right, keep going. Let's go. Let's do yeah, we got to keep moving, huh? Oh, brother. So it just goes on and on. I read, I read all the time about natural history stuff. This one was a story. I'll do it quickly. Um, the book was called, is called, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, what is that one called? It's, it's, it's a book about, it'll come to me in a minute, but it's about um, a sporting chance is the name of the book, and it's about unconventional hunting techniques. This is a crazy guy called Bob Maddox in the 1950s, and he had he hunted with cheetahs, he hunted with falcons, he hunted with blowguns, he hunted with like crossbows, all of this stuff, and he went all over America, and then he wrote books about it. And um, he was a nut, and his cheetah took off after a motorcyclist in the 1950s when he was hunting coyotes in Utah with a cheetah. And the motorcyclist was terrified, obviously. He watched it all unfold. The cheetah ran up and just decided at the last minute not to, not to knock him off his motorcycle. Oh, so it was a rare painting that had a happy ending. Yeah, okay, well, except oh, that I painted it as if it didn't yeah. have a happy ending. You're right. So now, you, this is the POV of the, vice, uh, the motorcyclist if the cheetah had a, actually caught up with him, knocked him off his bike. Yeah. Now he's down on the ground wounded. He looks up and this is what he sees. Amazing. And, and, and I had him driving a, a, a 1950s motorcycle, which many of them had what they call a suicide clutch, which was, you know, you have to actually take your hand off the, the, the handlebars to shift. Oh. And I just liked the, the idea of suicide as once, once the cheetah had attacked a human being, like this is the problem with the Joe Exotic thing. If you keep a cheetah and it kills someone, they, you've got to put the cheetah down. Exactly. It wasn't the cheetah's fault. It's your fucking fault for keeping a cheetah in Utah. Right. Like you're an idiot. Like, right. stop it. Stop <laughs> it. You know, stop <laughs> it. So keep Next going. Week, yeah, I want everyone to see everything. Yeah, it's uh, Sir William Hamilton. This is really shows, boy, I, it makes me feel like it's true that there's a, it is a wide range of reading involved. So Sir William Hamilton was the uh, uh, British ambassador to Naples in the 18th century. He made a study of volcanoes and of uh, Pompeian vases and things like this. He was very important in the, neo, the neoclassical movement in reintroducing Grecian and Roman ideals back into architecture and stuff in the during the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, and he was married to Emma Hamilton, who was a famous beauty. And Susan Sontag wrote The Volcano Lover about this. Okay. Um, I, 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 lo I love reading about him. Anyway, he had a monkey. It turned out he had a monkey, and his, his monkey was named Jack. And I've done several paintings of Jack. Because he said Jack was sort of a sexually obsessed, kind of ju uh, gender fluid, monkey he would he would like <laughs> wander around and, and sir william hamilton was a very proper diplomat mm -hmm. and this monkey might come up and like grab someone by the testicles and then smell his fingers you know like and and then <laughs> hamilton would write like delightfully about that like oh it's jack is acting up in the most delightful way and um it was like very british you know uh, I, I just have to ask do you have pets yeah i got a couple of dogs okay in the past, when I was raising my children in the Berkshires, there was quite a menagerie. Uh -huh. And we would catch things in the woods, like snakes, and keep it for a couple of weeks and then let it go. Yeah. So, but there were rabbits and guinea pigs and horses and dogs and okay. cats and all that. Yeah, okay, so go back to Hamilton. Bird feeders, everything. Go back to this painting in Hamilton. Yeah, so, so 
old Jack, he's up on a, you know, oh, and then they even said when, when, when people would get wise to the fact that he might grab them, that his servants would start covering themselves up when Jack walked by. And then when he walked by, they would relax and he'd grab them with their back leg because, you know, he has like a hand. So, and then William Hamilton would write it in his diary. And it's like, when I did a picture of Jack on his deathbed because when he died, Hamilton, it was like he had lost one of his Aww. favorite people. You know, he was bereft. Yeah. So, um, he's, he's on a Greek statue that he finds attractive, I imagine. Vesuvius is erupting. He, Hamilton had a collection of phalluses of, of what appeared to be like Pompeian dildos or something. So he's got one of those in his hand. Um, he's gotten into some, he knocked over the telescope and got into one of the books. He's, he's naughty, you know. Um, I, I just wanted to do a little portrait of him, you know, up to no good. Um, and he's at Hamilton's place overlooking the Bay of Naples. The, the Vesuvius was making tremendous eruptions during that time. And Hamilton was one of those crazy people that would go over there and walk around until his shoes caught on fire and, you know, <laughs> carry a bucket of water to put them out. Insane. I love it. Keep going. This is a really cool painting. This is big, 10 feet by 5 feet. So this thing towers over you. Feels pretty intimidating. Um, it there's a, a, a Norse myth. Uh, there's a, a a wolf called Fenrir that makes an appearance in the Norse myths. Fenrir is a wolf that keeps growing until he threatens the gods, and the gods decide they have to do something about it. So they they go to these they go to these magical little people that they live underground and they say we need a we need a way to, to fetter this beast and these guys come up with a magic ribbon that if you tie him up with it he won't be able to break it so they go to Fenrir with this ribbon the gods and they say do you think you can break this and he goes of course I can break that and then he gets weirded out he's like I, I don't trust you guys he's like because they want to tie it on him tie his legs together with it he says, somebody put their hand in, in my mouth, and, um, and then you can tie me up. So one of the gods, Odin, puts his hand in the mouth. They tie up Fenrir. He can't get loose. He bites Odin's hands off. And Odin's like, fine. I sacrificed my hand for, to save the world. And then they throw Fenrir in hell until the end of the world. And when the end of the world happens, Fenrir comes, uh, wakes up, breaks his bind, bind, binds, bind things, finally, and just wakes up. So I have two dogs, and I see what my dog looks like when he uh, wakes up, and you know, because they sleep all the fucking time. That's what dogs do. And um, so instead of every image I ever saw of Fenrir at the end of the world, it's Ragnarok. You know, that's the end of the world. Yeah. He's rah, and his, you know, phlegm and every, you know, fucking. Yeah. Everybody has to make it dramatic. You know, he came alive, and now he's gonna, because Fenrir then swallows the world and all of this. So in the middle of COVID and Trump and all of that stuff, I'm thinking, I'm going to paint this thing. This is Ragnarok, if there ever was a moment like this. I'm going to paint the end of the world. But the end of the world looks like a, a sleepy dog waking up, except that the, he's the wolf that's grown big enough to threaten the gods. So, so he's, that's why he looks this way. That's what this is about. And it's Iceland. It's all Icelandic myths and Norse myths. So It's an incredible image. I, lo I love this painting. And then, I, and then if you do the sort of fake Norse type faces, uh -huh. you realize they use them all for heavy metal album covers. <laughs> and I'm like, definitely. Because <laughs> I put it across the top with the umlaut and everything, and it looks so heavy metal. And I'm like, yes. And that's exactly where I feel strongest, mm -hmm. is when I am... Gilding the lily. Totally empowered to do something that's of a complete questionable taste. Uh -huh. And I'm like, yeah, the fake Norse typeface. <laughs> Dig it. Okay, we could do the next one. Oscar Kokoschka. He went to the London Zoo and painted the mandrel. And he wrote about it in his journal. And all he wrote was that... <clears throat> 
the mandrel, prof I, I went there after hours, I'd paint all night long until the dawn. The mandrel profoundly detested me, even though I brought him a banana to try to make friends. So this is the ultimate artistic ego nonsense. Like, that, that mandrel could care less about Oscar Kokoschka. <laughs> Let's be frank. He's got a grumpy expression. He's sitting alone in a cage in the London Zoo, and Oscar Kokoschka takes it personally. He thinks it's all about him. He thinks it's all, and I'm like, that's what artists do. That's so perfect. So I needed to paint it as if it was true. So what, what was it that the mandrel didn't like about Kokoschka? He was like a, like a fascist. He thought it was decadent. He's dragging, he's trying to get the painting away from Kokoschka. Kokoschka's like, wait! You see his hand coming in. I, I thought, okay, the mandrel hates your artwork. He thinks you're a shitty painter. He's like, that doesn't look like me. You're not a good painter, you know? And that is my copy of, so I can brag a little. This is a watercolor and gouache, and I had to paint a Kokoschka oil painting. You know what I mean? Out of watercolor and gouache, but make it look like a Kokoschka oil painting. I'm pretty proud of the fact that it. it looks like yeah, one. I'm like, that's a trick. Because you're painting paint. Because let's be frank, watercolor doesn't behave that way. Right. That's not how watercolor behaves. That's the way oil paint behaves. So I was in a, how am I going to do this kind of moment? And I just did it. I felt very happy with that. We can go to the next. So swans used to be a big deal in England for food. And if you had swans on your pond, they belonged to you if you were a landowner. But they didn't belong to the peasants, and they didn't belong to the commoners. They belonged only to the nobility, or the king, or the queen. And this went on for like 700 years, right? This is the, we have a right to the swans. If you grab one of my swans, you're going to be like, you know, crucified or something, you know. This is all that bullshit mm -hmm. hierarchy of... But they used to have swan marks, and they actually would either brand or cut a, 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 a special mark in the beak of the swan to show that it was yours, like branding cattle. Mm -hmm. Those little, right under signa nota is the, name, is the Latin name for that. Signa is swan, nota is to notate. Mm -hmm. So, and those are little beak designs below that would have been in the rolls, swan rolls, which are kept in England, and they're still in the library, so you could go and open up, and there's thousands of little swan beaks with the different markings of the different noble houses of people who's, you know, and so these are all my, my British aristocratic swans being set out to, like, conquer the world, you know? They're gonna go to India, they're gonna, they're bursting out to take over the whole planet. They're pretty aggressive. Swans are scary. So I just thought they're, they're sort of like, this is, these are the shock troops, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. So it's peaceful English countryside. That's a crazy story, right? Is, I've never heard about <laughs> swan, swan marks before. People don't know this stuff, yeah. but I do. And so my idea is if I come across a, a sentence or two like this in a book, I want to make a 10 foot by 5 foot painting. I want you to know about this. Yeah. And yet, I won't just tell you. Yeah. You know? So it's tricky. Okay, so here's good advice. The guy, uh, Bresson, who made Balthazar, uh, the movie about the donkey. Okay. You know, the, uh, uh, Robert, Robert Bresson, I think. Bresson, that yeah, filmmaker. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie, but. It's heaven, if you're me, because it's, it's, a, it's an animal story mm -hmm. um, told with almost no words. Mm -hmm. um, he said, and he's a genius filmmaker, French, kind of pre-New Wave, um, he said, uh, 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 hide the most important thing in your art, but hide it so that people can find it. <laughs> Which you have definitely done. <laughs> I just love that. I mean, that's like kind of a secret to the difference between hitting me over the head with it yeah. or allowing me to discover things on my own and feeling 
You can feel, you know, this is the problem. This is the difference, as subtle as it could be, between even, in illustration, even between Norman Rockwell mm -hmm. and, let's say, even N.C. Wyeth, mm -hmm. who might just put the most important thing in the shadow mm -hmm. or have the person turn, turning their back mm -hmm. that you really want to see. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like even an illustrator as, as literal as N.C. Wyeth still was able to do that Bresson thing a tiny bit. You know what I mean? Yes. So like, yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah, for the, for the reveal. Next. Oh, God. Are, are you getting tired of these stories? Because there's too many. No, but this I story's... do want to make sure we have time for do we have time for to Q... ask questions. I want that. Yeah, because we may have questions. to skip ahead a little. Because these um. stories get involved, you know? <laughs> this one particularly. I mean, I could listen to them. This is a human figure in it. Right behind the off, there's a nude. Just so you oh. can see that I can paint people as well as. Yeah, I thought the statue in the other one was about as close to. Yeah, no, this is legit. I'll just say, this animal is extinct. It's an auk. The last auk that was found on a small island off the coast of Scotland was found by some very superstitious fishermen in about 1840. It was one of the last seen, and they thought it was a witch. They had never seen this bird before because it had gotten so rare. They didn't know what it was, and they immediately went there. Like, it's a witch. We better kill it. So they killed it. And um, I just created the image in their head. It's a witch's Sabbath that would have happened on this island, has all the animals on this island, has the isolated, and the one, because of which is always tied into sex. So there's a young girl who lives on, on this island, Karen Keith, and then their own, these men, their own sexual fantasy, that she's the witch and the hawk at the same time, and they have to kill their lust for this person, you know. There you go. So that's quick, next. Oh my God, the Let's biggest see. rattlesnake ever. Next, no. Uh, <laughs> it's just Cabeza de Baca was a, a Spanish conquistador who, who got shipwrecked in Florida and he walked all the way from Florida to Mexico City. It took him 10 years. He was kept a slave by the Native Americans part of the time, then set himself up as a healer and then they treated him well, and then by the time he was found by the Spanish, he had gone native to such a degree that he tried to save the Indians around him that were then enslaved by the Spanish anyway, and then he went back to Spain and wrote it all down. And everywhere he went, there were rattlesnakes, um, which is something they don't have in Europe. So my idea of the nightmare that Cabeza de Baca might have out of his trauma was just this. You know, yeah. if he wakes up in Spain, like the corny movie moment when people go, <laughs> in the, which no one ever really does. When you have a nightmare, you wake up like that. <laughs> but it doesn't work in the movies. You have to sit all the way up sweating because that's the, that's the cool moment that gets you the Oscar. But uh, uh, anyway, when he woke up like that in a nightmare, it, you know, he would have been like, oh, that, this is what was in his head in my mind. He would have almost stepped on probably thousands of fucking rattlesnakes. Right. They have them in Florida, they have them all the way across the Southwest, and they have them in Mexico. So it's like, you never get away from this thing. Yeah. Do you spend more time painting or reading? You've got so probably many Probably equal times, equal yeah. amount of time, for sure. Because I'm so anxious and insomniatic, so I read all night, uh -huh. and then I get up and paint all day, and I guess I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> there you go. Let's go. It's an efficient use of time. Yeah, exactly. You're sleeping until you're dead. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, Amy. I love this. Uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese folk tale about how the tiger got his stripes. He was tricked by a farmer. He was tied up and set afire. You can, you can find the folk tale. It's not hard to find. But it's how the tiger got his stripes, Vietnamese folk tale. And I just thought it seems like a metaphor for Vietnam history, if there ever was one, like constantly getting their stripes over there. Like the Chinese are going to invade, the French are going to invade, the Americans are going to invade. You know, it's never, if you're in Vietnam, it's never safe. You know, so you're ready to grab your sickle and use it as a weapon if you have to, you know. Um, that's, so anyhow, he's getting away. He's going to go in the water and phew, yeah. he's not going to bur keep burning. Um, so this is the moment of relief from all of that. Um, 
Che just means burned in Vietnamese. And the dates for the end of the Vietnam War, 04, 30, 1975. Um, next. That same story. Good, I get to skip it. It's uh, the Audubon story. So I actually wanted to point this out. I did the dream of the Audubon story, his nightmare. This is much more of like sometimes I just do, I realize, let me put it this way, sometimes I just realize that the story itself looks pretty fucking surreal. So I thought, okay, I know the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I know that the, 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 the eagle dragged the trap more than a mile. What would that have looked like? And I just painted that. He's, he's gone up away from wherever the farm is at the foot of the mountains, up into the mountains, dragging his trap, and I just painted it. What is that down there, a fox? A little fox has been following him, because it's like, hey, maybe the eagle will die, and I'll get a big <laughs> meal out of it. That's, that's very foxy behavior. Foxes are kind of, you know, they're yeah. like, I'll, I got, if I keep my distance from them, right. Why they yeah, stop. something good might happen. Yeah. Looks like he's in trouble, that's good enough for me. Mm. So now somebody asked me, how do you do it physically? How do you make these things? So I thought we would go I'm ahead and do so that. so happy to see this. So this is a sketch that's probably the size of my hand right here. You know, like it could have been done, you know, I don't know, just sitting in a chair or somewhere. And this is sketchbook stuff for that. I, and so I would have probably done a dozen drawings before I got this one. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And you can see it's quite close to the painting you just saw. Next. Then I'll do a little tiny, this is, since I was going to do a five foot by 10 foot painting, I did a five inch by 10 inch watercolor study just to, just to figure out ahead of time. Because watercolor, as you know, super unforgiving. You can't make a mistake. And you don't find your way in to a 10 foot by 5 foot watercolor exactly. The happy accidents are going to happen. But you don't want the whole thing to be a happy accident if you're working on that scale. I'm thinking more like fresco painters did in the Renaissance. You have a lot of preparatory drawings. And then you have layers of color you want to put in. And your, your sense of discovery is in this part of it operation. So again, I might have five or six different color schemes, but I finally settled on this like pink, pink snow blue shadow thing. I, I really wanted to do that. Next. So then I do a full size pencil drawing, freehand, just on the paper. There's no gridding. I don't like the grid. I don't find it necessary. I want to use my body. I want to just find my way into the drawing. So a lot of freedom in this process as well. Um, definitely avoid the grid unless you're, unless you're a billboard painter and you really have to do the whole side of a building or something. I mean, there's times when you have to do it, but rare in my case. Underpainting, I know that I want to make the snow out of these colors. I better put the pale, working from pale colors towards dark. Right? Because it's watercolor, right? We know this a little bit, right? You can go. I'm, again, working from the background towards the foreground because some things are going to be in, painted on top. Many things are going to be painted on top of the background. I wouldn't want to be trying to paint these background details around things, right, that are in front. I want to paint my things that are in front on top of the things that are in the back if possible. So I, now I'm underpainting for the eagle. So if we're in a very cold environment, I wanted the eagle to be full of blood in a sense, full of warmth. It's still alive. Um, so I, underpainting is orange, very much the opposite of the feeling of snow. Um, next. And then if I paint the brown over that, of course it shows through and gives a richness to the feathers and that translucency to the wings that I'm going to want later. So further, there's 
you know, just adding layers to the bird. The background is pretty much kitted out. I painted the branch that he's dragging over, you know, so because that because I had finished the background uh, enough. Um, next, yeah, just to show when I then the last thing is just adding all kinds of detail. You know, everything has been big blocks up until now. Very little thought of detail, uh, but now the finished paint. So now we know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's you shouldn't have shown it. There's a close up. I know. It's like that joke, that thing about the owl. You know, they have that in the internet, how to draw an owl, and it shows the circles, and then it's like it says, draw two circles, then draw the fucking owl. And then there's just a finished drawing of an owl, perfect drawing of an owl. And you're like, yep, thanks for the help. <laughs> That's it. That's my slide presentation. I love it. Guys, we have a little bit more time. Who has questions? Yes. I mean, I, am, I do mess around with that um, warm, cold thing. Lately, in the show that I have coming up, there's a lot of um, more Hollywood cold, warm lighting happening. You know, so I'll have like sunset light hitting the side of something and a cool shadow. And, you know, so it isn't always just the body temperature of the animal. In this case, it was. Sometimes it's a metaphor. Sometimes the color is more metaphorical like or it, or something like that or it helps the narrative and sometimes it is just a lighting effect um uh because you'll see um but like it, it still aids the narrative i have one now i just did of a wolf he's a werewolf um but he's just it's a painting of a wolf that, and he, it's warm inside this sort of it's a 12th century werewolf story that was this and it's warm inside and, and cool outside, and, and the light is accordingly that way. And um, I, I don't know, there's just a, it sort of has that Vermeer-like thing of side light coming in the window. Um, so yeah, I, I, as far as color, my ideas about color, when I was a Rhode Island School of Design student, they had a program that, um, where we studied in, in Italy our senior year, uh, the European Honors Program. And um, they have a Palazzo in Rome, RISD. I think they still have it, Palazzo Cenci. And we've got a Palazzo there too. <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty good. Scary. It's pretty good, I must say. <laughs> Anyhow, northern, Europe, northern Italy, going to Assisi, going to Sigiato and Lorenzetti, and uh, basically uh, Trecento guys, uh, Simona Martini, those people. That was the turning point in my life as far as deciding I wanted to do narrative pictures. And it also set the colorist bar very, very high. Because if you go look at that stuff in situ, uh, there, you know, you can see it a little bit in the altered paintings that we have here. In, but going to Italy, obviously, and seeing the frescoes um, in place, the 14th century frescoes in Italy changed everything for me. It gave me this idea about scale. It gave me this idea about the total intensity of color. Um, I preferred it to the later Renaissance when color became less important and form became, and chiaroscuro became more important. You know, like, you know, uh, there's almost no color in Caravaggio, but there's a lot of color in Shalta. And so I, I wanted something in between. <laughs> uh, you know, which you get in the sort of northern Europeans sometimes. Um, yeah. Um, just, I, I felt like I noticed um, in the detail of the, the wings of the eagle that there was, it looked like there was gouache. Yeah, there are gouache highlights. So is that just for details? Is that sort of like your finesse? Generally, thing? yeah. Okay. Generally, the big blocks of color are, are, are I'm going to want them to be transparent watercolor <laughs> so that I get all of the 
whole benefit of that. Uh, there's a big difference between the translucency and radiance of a transparent watercolor, yeah. um, where the paleness is actually reflected light off of the paper, rather than reflected light off of just pure chalky pigment, yeah. which has a slightly deader quality to it. But I've also noticed in your work in person, it creates the illusion of the imagery coming forward in the yeah. picture plane. Absolutely. Sort of transparency you know, tends to recede in space. Yes. So there's this wonderful, uh, it's almost like a, you know, atmospheric perspective because the, the birds or the animals tend to be coming forward. Absolutely true. So the backgrounds will be almost exclusively transparent watercolor and often loose and maybe allowed to bleed a little bit or allowed to do watercolor things yeah. that tend to blur the focus a tiny bit. And then when you come right into the crisp foreground, that's when we just say thank you, Durr, for painting that rabbit that way and for teaching us how to do that. Because that's exactly what he, I don't do anything different than what he did with that rabbit. Yeah. He, 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 there's a base brushwork thing that's quite loose. And then there's just picking out little gouache hairs here and there right. that suddenly give the illusion that all the hairs have been painted yeah. when indeed they have not. But the, the illusion of three-dimensionality is... Really and the three-dimensionality... I was given permission because I had a show at the, at the uh, uh, Albertina in Vienna to look at that rabbit in person. I had it right here. And it's, it's in the room with you. Yeah. It's a breathing rabbit in the room with you. And you look in his eye and you can see the window that was in the room with Durr and that rabbit before he killed it, <laughs> or maybe even after. Because the deal is, for sure, they asked me how I thought, they, he said, how could he paint all this detail with a living rabbit? And I said, he drew sketches when it was alive and then he killed it. And he left the eyes open, so there's, that's not an issue. Yeah. And, 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 he, and then he painted quickly and, and then he ate it probably with like mustard sauce. Right. I, I hope you used it. Yeah. I hope it didn't go to waste. I, yes. Uh, in one month in your career, you start to read and basically read and create things. In what moment did you decide to get inspiration of culture, history? I, I basically, most of my reading at this point, I'm hoping it's going to give me an idea for a picture. So I have like general ideas when I go into reading. So I'll tell you, quite, <coughs> oh, I don't have my bag with me, but I will show you. Uh, right now I'm reading about a guy called Felix Salton. And he wrote the original book that they made into the movie Bambi. But Felix Salton was a Viennese. He died right after he, he was... A, Jew, so he had to leave Vienna, and he died right after uh, the Second World War. He actually died a few days after Hitler killed himself. So Felix Salton loved hunting. He hunted all the time. So it's one of those hunter, and, the, and it's brutal in a way that the Disney film isn't. Like, the, there's no thumper in it, but the thumper that is there, the rabbit that's in it, there's rabbits that get shot in this book, and they're, they're, they're trailing their entrails and stuff. I mean, or, or they're broken legs, and they're saying, can you help me, can you help me? You know, like, it's war. It's, and he's, you know, Salton's in Europe at this time, so this, is, this isn't a joke, this book. It's not even a kid's book. It's really dark. And then I read that Salton apparently had also, I'm reading a biography of him right now. I haven't, I just only got it in the mail yesterday, so... I only know the sort of back of the, you know, in the introduction. But apparently he also, he wrote for money, and he was always desperate for money, so he wrote pornography too. Like, he wrote pornographic novels. And um, so he, he's, you know, it's great that it's Disney on one side, it's like, but Disney didn't make the film out of it. An enterprising fellow. <laughs> so I'm, I know pretty much that I'm gonna get a painting idea out of this book. I don't see, if I don't, there's something either wrong with me, or I'm not sure there's, I can avoid getting, you know, right? Right. If you're that's me, that's Walton Ford territory. Sure. Doesn't it feel easy, like kind of a slam dunk? And all I did was read uh, a, a review in the New Yorker of a recent 
uh, retranslation of Bambi, um, which is about to come out, which I've ordered, but the reviewer said the older translation was better anyway. And then the reviewer, because it's the New Yorker, they went in depth and they mentioned a few things about Felix Salton, and I was like, I gotta know more. <laughs> I gotta know more, right? And so they mentioned this biography, and so I ordered it online and I got it. So that's how it goes. And sometimes like one of you will come up and be like, hey, did you ever hear about the blah? And I'll be like, actually, no. You know, it happens quite often. I'm very humble about what I know and what I don't know. And anybody with an animal story, you know, like I was just at this place and I heard about this. It, it sometimes leads somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people send me books sometimes, it's great. Um, I'm friends with a lot of environmentalists now. Um, and sometimes they know stuff. They're like, have you ever read blah, blah, blah? And I'll be like, no. Yeah. But explorers accounts, uh, certain, you know, people who live in certain parts of the world where there's a lot of animals, um, you know, like India, <laughs> you know, uh, there's certain parts of the world that seem richer in that kind of thing than others. Um, a lot of cultures that have animal fables as part of their, of their way, but I'm pretty careful about cultural appropriation. I like doing it. I have a right to, to the stories that have to do with the European kind of conquest of the rest of the world and the collection of the animals and fauna from all these different parts of the world. That is part of my heritage for better or for worse, right? But I'm not keen on say, oh, I found a really cool uh, uh, Indian folktale and I'm simply going to illustrate it. I'm going to illustrate it through the lens of my own misunderstanding, my own cultural misunderstanding, using my own uh, culture's natural history language, imagery. This looks very European. You know, so it, it's important for me to figure that out, you know. I don't want to do, I'm not criticizing other artists, but like there's, it always rubbed me a slight, like Francisco Clemente doing these sort of things that look like Indian miniatures. And I'm like, ah, it's not really his language. I don't really want to object to that because I think we can go too far but uh, with that kind of argument. But at the same time, I'm just not comfortable with it. I don't, I, 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 I lived in India for six months and I didn't know what the hell was going on, you know? And I backpacked all over the world, North Africa and Mexico, and, and I've been to Russia, and I've been, you know, if you go to these places, you really have to give up the idea that you know what's best for these people, that you know whether this tradition or that tradition should be thrown away, you know, this is crazy, you know? Right. You gotta leave all that shit behind. And just, oh wow, I'm gonna take my shoes off. I'm going in a mosque right now. You know, like just be, be just cool, so man. Exactly. Try to figure out what's going on. Like I was in Egypt and that's what we did. We went and saw the medieval mosques in Egypt. And it, it just gotta just be polite. Right. Try to figure it out. Right. And, and, and then know that you can't figure it out. So most of these, I think the POV, is, is my own, or at least a cultural POV that I make sense right. in, you know? Yeah, or wonder at the mystery of it all. Yeah, it's like... Yeah. Any other questions? I, when Peter Sheldahl wrote that, it was like 19, probably 1996 or so, in The Village Boys, um, I, I felt like, and you've probably been in it, that he really ha had my number. 
Like, it felt like an Achilles heel. It almost felt like, oh, I was hoping nobody would notice. <laughs> you know, it really felt like I was busted. And, and, cause he was like, don't tell me how to think. And I'm like, God, I didn't want to do that. And we talked about that a little, or I talked about it a little earlier with the, with the Norman Rockwell thing. Um, the, pro the problem with many Norman Rockwell paintings, there, I always use this one example, like the kid finds out there's no Santa Claus. He shows him, he pulled the Santa Claus outfit out of the bottom drawer, it's his dad's drawer, and he's got the Santa Claus outfit, and he's like, <laughs> how many interpretations are you allowed? How much is your imagination allowed within that image? And Peter Sheldahl, again, had written a review of, of, of Norman Rockwell, talk, talking about how beautiful his paintings are, obviously, and saying he sucks all the air out of the room. You know, you're with a, you're with a sort of know-it-all. You're with somebody who tells you what you need to think. And you're like, God, I want a little more room. Like, give me a little something to think about, you know? And, you know, I... It's like the movie Power of the Dog was pretty good that way. She did the Brassal thing, you know, where she, she hid the most important thing, where you could find it. But many people are like, what the fuck did I just see? And, and you actually saw something that will reveal itself. And then when it does, it makes the whole, all the other scenes more meaningful. It makes the whole movie worth watching again, even though it's slow as hell, super grim, no sense of humor. Could you give me a little bit of something? I sometimes those people made jokes, you know. But no. Anyhow, it's dark. I mean, there's things I don't like about watching. I didn't enjoy it, but I thought, oh, she's making a pretty intense piece of art here. And it's weird that there's still grown-ups making movies about people. That's really nice instead of just superheroes or special effects um, or you know a ride. I, I, I really did grow up in a, I feel like I was lucky that instead of it being the, spy, the 15th Spider-Man movie that was the blockbuster when I was a kid, it was like The Godfather. Like they're lined up around the block to watch The Godfather and you can't get a ticket and you can't get in and you gotta wait until it calms down to see The Godfather. It's like, well, something's going on. Not necessarily for the best. Um, there's plenty of garbage that came out around The Godfather, obviously, but that was the biggest hit. So that's an interesting moment for art, you know? And now that someone, but let's say, cool, she got a bunch of Academy Award nominations because people kind of know it when they see it. This is something, you know, she, she makes art. She's not incapable of making a stupid movie. Right. Um, you know, you might not enjoy what she does, but she's not gonna make garbage. And I always feel that about my stuff. I want it to be indisputably your preference whether you like it or not. You, have a, you can decide whether you prefer this or don't prefer it, but nobody can say that it's garbage. <laughs> you know, like, that's just shit, you know? Like, he didn't think it out. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. I know exactly what I'm doing, and I know exactly how to do it. And if you don't like it, Cool. You don't have to come to this restaurant, but I don't care. And that's not even personal. That's just, that makes sense. So I don't get offended. I'm not offended if you don't like it, but you can't call it garbage. Come on. Like, it's like, you know, like watching Power of the God. Like, I don't like it, maybe, but I get it. It's, an, I see why people think it's amazing. And I do actually get it. That's the kind of movie I love because I'm very much a history freak and I want to see things reconstructed and like practically my favorite movie is McCabe and Mrs. Miller and it's a similar kind of movie. Um, they made movies like this in the 70s and, um, and I went to RISD to be a film student. So the narrative aspect of my work is very important <clears throat> and, and I don't mind uh, accessing sort of cheesy spectacle as well like with the bear painting you know. Um, you just mentioned that you had a show coming up. Tell us about that. So later. March 11th at Gagosian, the, the big, the, the flagship one, 
on 24th uh, I Street. I guess, what is it, 555, is that it? Yeah. Anyway, the big, the one on 11, 11th Avenue and 20, 24th Street, 3rd Street? Yeah, 24th, maybe. I think. Um, the Gagosian Gallery. The we will be there. March 11th, yeah. And, and now uh, most of, uh, some of these paintings will be in that show, like the one that's up on the thing now. And um, uh, uh, really big deal for me, actually, because he, Paul Kastman died a few years ago and he had represented me my whole life um, since I was in my mid-30s. And it was, I didn't know what the hell was going to happen, but Gagosian was always there in the background because he always wants to steal an artist if he can. And he, he was not allowed to steal me when Paul was alive because we had just done too much together. Yeah. But once Paul was gone, I was like, okay, let's, we're gonna go ahead and pull the trigger on this. And um, it's not like I'm just gonna work with him. Uh, there's other gallerists involved in my career, um, but um, it's, I'm really grateful for them because they kind of came along at the moment when I could have, I, I mean, because I'm in grief, you know, and, and if you're in grief and you're also like, how am I gonna sell my pictures at the same time, you're a little, it, it was weird. It was a weird time for me. At, as, at such a high level of my career yeah. to feel so adrift right. and, and just sad. Yeah. And they kind of sent the message like, don't worry about it. Like we've always, because I did show in Beverly Hills with Gagosian while Paul was still alive. This is more meat and potatoes art business, but you guys are interested in that stuff. <laughs> I was allowed to show in LA because Paul didn't have a gallery in LA. So I showed with Gagosian in LA, but I stayed loyal in New York. And then Paul passed away. And the Gagosian gallery kind of immediately was just like, please don't worry. Yeah. And I was like, that's, I'm grateful. You can hear a lot of stories about these people yeah. that are that powerful, but that was a, that was a very uh, yeah. nice thing for me to hear. Well, we are grateful that you were here with us tonight. <laughs> thank you. Juan, thank you. We're grateful for your curiosity that leads to all this amazing work and for your generosity to us at the school. I love this school. Time. This school is great. You guys are great. I really appreciate it. All right. That was special. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Andy, for starting it. <laughs>